So uh, I didn't mean to, but somehow we stumbled into ubiquitin-mediated proteolysis, and it's almost taken over the lab. Uh, uh, we st stumbled onto it, as you'll hear from the point of view of DNA replication, but then it's a gift that kept, keeps on giving, and soon we have all these stories happening related to this subject. So what I'll tell you about is prevention of re-replication in a normal cell cycle, mostly in summary form. I'll show you about a new venture about how re-replication uh, causes so much DNA damage that it actually could be a mode of chemotherapy. Uh, in the process of discovering these, we started focusing in on this new E3 ligase, CRL4CDT2, and we'll discuss two uh, novel substrates for this ligase. And right in the end, I'll tell you something that Lawrence is familiar with because he heard me talk about it recently. We've just stumbled across a new substrate for the HPV E6 oncogene. So, you know, it's like bringing coals to Newcastle, but I thought I'll mention about that in the end. So let's go on. So this, of course, is the canonical picture of how regions get licensed. There's ORC, which binds sequences that are not very well defined. Probably they aren't, def uh, they are ill-defined sequences, uh, which recruit CDC6 and CDT1, which together facilitate the loading of the MCM227 complex, which is, of course, a major component of the replicative helicase. And the story that I'll start with was something that a student in my lab discovered many years back, 10 years back, when he found that geminin interacts with CDT1. Uh, geminin had been known to prevent the loading of MCM227 complexes, and essentially we found the mechanism by interacting with CDT1, it prevents the uh, loading of the MCM227. However, it turned out that geminin was not in the cell to actually prevent the primary cycle of replication. When one looked at where geminin was present in the cell cycle, it was present in the second half of the cell cycle, while all that licensing that I told you with CDT1 and everything is happening in G1. So clearly, geminin could not be preventing this first cycle of replication. And we hypothesized, and that subsequently uh, came out to be correct, was that the geminin was important in this second half to prevent relicensing. So that cells replicate their DNA only once in the cell cycle and not more than once. That's important because if S phase and M phase did not alternate, you'd have problems either way. Suppose you had multiple cycles of S phase, that is re-replication, so you'd have extra copies of genetic material that the cell wouldn't know what to do with in mitosis. Conversely, suppose a cell just went on into multiple cycles of mitosis without DNA replication, you would have reduction division, and that too is bad. So this alternation of S and M is essentially critical, and I'm going to focus primarily on how cells prevent re-replication. So yes, so you found that geminin prevents licensing of pre-RC formation by inhibiting CDT1, and that's important. But it also turned out that CDT1 is degraded in the second half of the cell cycle. It's present in this first half uh, to pr promote the licensing, but as soon as the cell enters S phase, CDT1 gets degraded. And that's where I, I'm going to start this story. So the way we prove this, of course, is by altering the CDT1 geminin balance, and any, any manipulation as shown here that increases CDT1 or decreases geminin ended up in re-replication. So how is the CDT1 degraded? So now I introduce to you the Cullen complexes, which figure prominently in this story. So the, this one, you are, most of you are very familiar with, the Cull1, which pairs up with the bridging factor, skip1, to reach out to a substrate recognition factor called the F-box proteins which brings in the substrate. And Cull1, of course, brings in the RBX1, which together uh, recruit the E2 with the ubiquitin, and that's what promotes the polyubiquitination, right? So F-box proteins are usually substrate recognition adapters of the Cull1, and uh, I'm going to talk sort of in passing about an F-box protein that actually doesn't work in this way, but we'll come back to that shortly. The Cull4 complex is anatomically almost similar. Cull1, Cull4, the bridging protein is DDB1. The substrate recognition protein is called DCAFs. They're usually WD40 containing proteins, and that binds the substrate. And again, the RBX1, E2 part is the same. The DCAF that we'll be focusing in on a lot is CDT2. So that's unfortunate because the substrate we'll be talking about is CDT1, and the DCAF is CDT2, so keep them separate. And on this side, the F-box protein that, will, that is important for the CDT1 story is skip2, right? So that's how you define these complexes. So when we started dissecting how the CDT1 gets uh, degraded, 
we found that there are two redundant pathways in which it was getting degraded. The way that came about was if you delete the first 98 amino acids of CDT1, CDT1 was no longer degraded in S phase. If you take the first 98 amino acids and attach it to a foreign protein, that gets degraded in S phase. So we figured that the sequence was somewhere here that was important for the degradation. Now, there's been significant work on proteins that get degraded in S phase, and a lot of them are substrates of the skip 2 cul one complex. So normally, uh, proteins, many proteins, CDC6, for example, gets phosphorylated by cyclin-dependent kinases on a uh, CDK substrate site, and the cyclin-dependent kinase interacts with the CY motif, the cyclin binding motif, and that causes the phosphorylation and targets the protein to the skip 2 cul one complex. So you thought that's probably the mechanism. It turned out not to be true, because when you mutated this motif, what I'm calling the black module here, the protein was still degraded in S phase. So we knew that there is some other sequence somewhere out here, and along this time, we got a chance discovery that helped us out significantly, which was that people noticed that CDT1 was also degraded very significantly after DNA damage, after UV irradiation. And that damage signal was also located in the first 98 amino acids. And that damage signal also was not eliminated by mutating the black box. So you mutate the black box and the protein was still uh, degraded. So you figured we'll continue mutating sequences out here until we find something that will block degradation in a DNA damage. Turned out this threonine was important. So when you mutated that, what I'm calling the red module, now the CDT1 was no longer degraded by radiation. So you say, aha, that's how this protein is degraded in S phase. Turned out to be wrong, because when you mutate that, the protein is still degraded in S phase. So there are two independent modules present in this area, which are responsible for degrading the protein in, in S phase. So you figured we'll mutate both of them and see if the protein is stable in S phase. Turned out to be correct. So here's a black module mutation, and CDT1 is degraded in S phase. Another black module mutation, a red module mutation, CDT1 is degraded in S phase. But you combine them, combine the red and the black mutation, now the CDT1 is stable. So there are two redundant pathways, which is why we had such a difficult time finding out how the CDT1 was getting degraded in S phase. So what is this red module? So this is the original uh, uh, observation that if you mutate the threonine 7, the CDT1 is stable after DNA damage. So now we have to find out what this red module is. And a poor postdoc spent a year trying to look for phosphorylation. You know, the usual phosphopeptide antibody and phosphopeptide maps, there's absolutely no sign of phosphorylation. So then we wised up and looked at the sequences adjoining this threonine and noticed that there are other sequences that are conserved around that threonine. And we wondered whether this was really a sequence that was important for the degradation and we just happened to chance in on the threonine. And indeed, that turned out to be true. Because if you mutate this glutamine or this valine or this phenylalanine, you can see that the protein which normally gets degraded very nicely after radiation is not degraded as effectively. So it looks like this whole sequence is required. So this is when the penny dropped because that sequence was nothing more than a PIP box, a PCNA interacting peptide motif. We had dis first described PIP boxes in these two proteins, P21, many years back, and FEN1, and then uh, David Lane and many others have done similar work, and it's generally believed that PIP boxes have a sequence something like this, QXX, a relatively hydrophobic residue, XX, and then two aromatic hydrophobic, uh, aromatic residues, could be, could be tyrosine also. So that's sort of a PCNA interacting peptide motif that allows these proteins to interact with PCNA. So this is odd. CDT1 is an initiation factor. There's no particular reason why it should interact with PCNA. And not only that, we are saying that this interaction with PCNA may be responsible for the degradation of the protein. Strange. You know, of course, what PCNA is. That's the clamp that is attached to the polymerase for processivity. So that's the really primary function of PCNA that's known. Nobody has sort of implicated PCNA, had implicated PCNA in protein degradation. So does CDT1 interact with PCNA? And the answer is yes. So this is even under basal conditions, if you immunoprecipitate PCNA, you can see small amounts of CDT1 associated with it. If you irradiate, you see more and more CDT1 come in associated, especially if you block the degradation pathway with MG132. So CDT1 does interact with PCNA. Is PCNA required for the degradation of PCNA? And that too turned out to be a yes. 
So here is the degradation of CDT1 normally following radiation. This is what happens after PCN and siRNA, much less degradation. Hui Zhang had published independently that DDB1, which is one of those components of the CAL4 complex, is required for the degradation of CDT1. So we just wanted to make sure that was still true in our hands and that that turned out to be true. So DDB1 knockdown also stabilized the CDT1 somewhat. So this was a strange story. Here is this PCN, which is a polymerase, uh, a polymerase accessory factor. It seems to be required in the same degradation pathway that's used by CAL4 DDB1. So there are two modules, a black module and a red module, which uses these strange proteins. I won't drag you through all the data, but the model that emerged is something like this. CDT1 uses the PIP box to interact with the PCNA, and it's this interface that's recognized by the CDT2 part of the CAL4 DDB1. And then, of course, ubiquitin can be added on to the CDT1 to cause the polyubiquitination and the degradation. Very strange. Here's a processivity factor, and there's absolutely no reason to believe that this should have any role in degradation of proteins, but that's what it's turning out to be. Am I going too fast? Uh, it's okay. So, how is re replication prevented in the cell, same cell cycle? So, the Gemini and CDT1 balance is clearly important, and CDT1 is clearly degraded by two pathways. There's this CUL1 pathway and the CUL4 pathway. I'll come back to these later. But of course, what kept on haunting us was cyclin-dependent kinase activity. Naismith and Nurse in the mid-90s had shown in Cerevisia and Pombe that inhibiting the cyclin-dependent kinase was a sure way of causing re-replication in the yeasts. But we could see no sign of that in mammalian cells. In fact, if we uh, altered the Geminin CDT1 balance in cells like HCT116, which is a colon cancer cell, um, the protein was happily, uh, uh, happily the cell went into re-replication, even though the cyclin-dependent kinase was still pretty dominant. So that was strange, that was a discrepancy. But the discrepancy actually got solved in a very peculiar way. It got solved in a cell line, HeLa. In HeLa, no matter what we did to alter the Gemini CD21 balance, we could never get re-replication. However, in a completely blind genetic screen, this guy uh, was screening for F-box proteins that were important for cell cycle in mammalian cells. And what he noticed was one F-box protein, EMI1, was critical for viability. When EMI1 was knocked down, the cells died, but they died in a very peculiar way. They died with huge nuclei as though they had re-replicated their DNA. And that turned out to be spot on. It turned out that what, what EMI1 does Although it's an F-box protein, EMI1 is well known for inhibiting the APC ubiquitin ligase complex. And so you can imagine that when you knock down EMI1, this APC is active like crazy in, in S phase, and that results in the degradation of its substrates, geminin and cyclin A, right? The degradation of both the substrates causes re-replication. However, when you individually do an SRN of geminin, there's no re-replication. Individually, you do an siRNA of cyclin A, there's no re-replication. It's only when you get rid of both of them, as we do through here, you get re-replication. So again, this business about different cell lines. In HCT116 colon cancer cell lines, this pathway doesn't seem to be that dominant, which is why just by altering the Geminin CDT1 balance, we got extensive re-replication. In HIDA cells, both these pathways seem to be equally important for preventing re-replication. Okay? So cyclin CDKs are important, and uh, it was just an accident of the cell line that we started out with. So getting rid of both of them caused re-replication. One suspects that this, this strategy is still preserved because there's probably some use to it. Because in normal development, there are some tissues that go into re-replication. For example, the placental trophoblast cells or megakaryocytes. And at least in the placental trophoblast cells, Ron Lasky, for example, has shown that when they go into the re-replication modes, one of the things that happens is that EMI1 gets down-regulated dramatically. And when people do a knockdown of EMI1, it's an embryonic lethal, but it's embryonic lethal with almost all the cells becoming trophoblast-like with excessive DNA replication. So most likely, modulation of EMI1 is something that's used in normal development. Okay? So yes, 
So cyclin-dependent kinases also prevent licensing or pre-RC formation, and there's a whole huge literature of the number of factors that cyclin-dependent kinases inhibit by uh, phosphorylating. CDC6 and uh, MCMs, all of them get phosphorylated and various things happen to them that prevents relicensing. But geminin CDT1 is important also secondarily. Now I'll turn to the DNA damage checkpoint pathway. It turned out that even if you induce re-replication, it's not like the cells were hanging out very happily and very comfortably. In fact, when you first did this geminin CDT1 uh, imbalance, we did that by overexpressing CDT1, and we found that the overexpression caused extensive detectable re-replication only in P53 minus cells. When you tried to do the experiment in cells that were P53 plus, we just couldn't see the re-replicated cells. It took us some time to figure that out, and the answer turned out to be, oops, sorry, I'll come back to that. The answer turned out to be that the re-replication was causing extensive DNA damage, which was activating all these checkpoint pathways. So if a cell was positive for P53, the P53 got phosphorylated, became stable, and that immediately shut down apoptotic pathways and, sorry, that immediately promoted apoptosis and cell cycle arrest, and so we could never see re-replication. The apoptosis caused the cells to disappear from the plate, and we could never see the re-replication. It was only when cells were P53 minus, so this part of the pathway got truncated, only then could we see the re-replication in these cells. So P53 was getting activated by checkpoint pathways. Now before I finish, just for uh, your benefit, Miguel, I inserted this slide just to show you what re-replicated nuclei look like. Normal size nuclei and DAPI staining, and this is a re-replicated nuclei. It's huge. So it's very easy to spot microscopically. And you see a lot of DNA damage, foci, and things like that in, in these cells. So now this is a new thing that was getting introduced, that there's a reason why we don't see too much, so much re-replication in our cells, that even if there is re-replication, the cell is going, ah, there's too much DNA damage, and checkpoint pathways get activated, and immediately either the cell gets killed or the cell cycle gets arrested. And this turned out to be uh, done in multiple different ways. Here's another way in which it can be done. If you do geminin RNAi, you again activate the checkpoint pathways, but in this case, the bulk of the checkpoint signaling goes through check one, which, as many of you know, blocks the cell cycle at the G2M progression by phosphorylating these sites. But the net effect is the same. The cell refuses to hang around or continue dividing if it has been induced to do re-replication. Re-replication is very bad for the cell. We'll come back to this theme shortly. But then, what kind of circumstances would you expect re-replication to happen? Clearly, circumstances where these checkpoint pathways are deranged. Are there paths? I showed you one example, P53 minus cells, for example, the checkpoint pathways are deranged. It turned out that this pathway is extremely dependent on another tumor suppressor, the Fanconi anemia pathway. The Fanconi anemia pathway is a, it's, it's a pretty rare disease, but it's very highly featured in uh, DNA damaged circles because uh, the patients have progressive bone marrow failure, probably due to stem cell failure, and cancer susceptibility. And it turned out that it's basically a very fancy ubiquitin ligase pathway. It ubiquitinates various proteins that f promote DNA re damage repair and also activate checkpoint pathways. And indeed, we showed that the Fanconi and Mayer core complex and BRCA1 are required following re-replication to activate these checkpoint pathways. The reason why I make this point is that this could be yet another way in which patients who have mutations in the Fanconi and Mia pathway or in BRCA1 could be susceptible to DNA damage. I think re-replication happens fairly often in our cells. But most of our cells are competent because they've got the FA pathway and the BRCA1 pathways, and they cull those cells, they kill them. But when these mutations are around, then those cells are hanging around with the extra DNA with all that damaged DNA, and that's where the problems come. That's where I think the cancer susceptibility phenotype comes from. This is how the DNA damage is supposed to happen. Nobody's actually seen it, but people think, here's a fork, here's the leading strand, and here's the lagging strand with the Okazaki fragments, and imagine that as this fork is progressing, another fork fires, and the two forks collide. So what do you see? you see one leading strand trying to replicate across a nicked template. And so that, of course, is a DNA double strand break. 
and that would lead to fork collapse. The helicase and the polymerase would get delinked. The helicase would happily go along to uh, unravel more single-stranded DNA. So the net result is there's a lot of single-stranded DNA and double-stranded DNA breaks that are produced in these re-replicating cells. Why am I harping on this? To tell you about the therapeutic opportunity. So this Cull4 complex, like all cullens, needs to be nedulated for it to be active. A NED8 protein has to be attached to it. Millennium they called MLN4924. They wanted to develop, Millennium, of course, are the people who brought you Velcade, the proteasome inhibitor. So they're now trying to look for other ways in which to inhibit these pathways. So the idea was that MLN4924 would prevent the nedulation of Cull4, and then that would inactivate Cull4 and Cull1 also, all the cullens, as a matter of fact. So when they added this MLN4924 to these cells, they had a very surprising result. Well, first part of the result was pretty uh, expected, which is that the nedulation of the cullens diminished significantly at higher and higher concentrations of the MLN. P27, which is a substrate for the Cull1 complex, increased, other proteins increased. The weird result that they found was that there is extensive DNA damage. They could see phospho H2X going up, they could see apoptosis. So what they thought about was, is there any particular substrate of the cullens whose stabilization would cause DNA damage? And much to their credit, they remembered all our papers on the Geminin CDT1 balance because we had told them that whenever you increase CDT1, we are getting DNA damage. And they find some increase in CDT1, not very impressive, but some increase in CDT1 with this drug. So then they started wondering was, is this increase in CDT1 leading to this re-replication and this DNA damage? So they did the standard fax analysis. And this is what their fax profile looked like. This is normal cells, G1, S, and G2. This is what happens when you add MLN4924. G1 population is mostly gone. A lot of cells piled in G2, and lots and lots of cells with greater than G2 DNA content. That's where they left it. But I wasn't convinced, because I wasn't sure that cells would, you know, cullens, there's so many substrates of cullens. So it was hard to believe that most of the toxicity that they're seeing was coming simply from the stabilization of CDT1 especially because that stabilization looked very wimpy. So I decided to test that. Oh, this is their data showing that MLN4924, this is a xenograft of HCT116 growing happily, and this is MLN4924 completely shutting down the uh, growth of the xenograft tumor. So they're very happy about this particular new line of therapy where they would be inducing re-replication and causing DNA damage and killing the cells. But I wasn't sure that was the way the cullens were working. So we wanted to test that in our hands. So we got some MLN4924 from their cells. And the experiment that we are going to do is essentially knock down each of the replication factors, CDT1, ORC, CDC6, et cetera, to see which was the rate limiting factor, which is the one whose level was important for the re-replication. Because I had this sneaky feeling that maybe many, many replication factors are getting stabilized, and that's why there's re-replication. But amazingly, their original premise turned out to be correct. So this is the amount of re-replication that you see. In DMSO-treated cells, not much, but you treat with MLN4924, and there's a significant stimulation of the re-replication. But if you knock down the CDT1, the re-replication drops dramatically, right? You don't see any of that if you manipulate the levels of ORCs or CDC6s or MCMs. It just seems to be CDT1. So that's interesting. So then we started wondering, so how is the re-replication killing these cells? How does MLN4924 kill these cells? Is it uh, by just activating the checkpoint pathways or is there additional things going on? We don't know, but one of the things that we discovered along the way was that this drug is extremely toxic. You have to hand it to the cells for only an hour and then wash away the drug and you get extensive re-replication in 24 hours. So just that one hour of exposure to this drug has enough memory for the cells to go into re-replication about eight to nine hours later. So that was interesting. The other thing that was interesting was this drug worked exclusively in S-phase cells. 
So here, for example, is an ex experiment where cells are released from mitosis. So they're going on synchronously through the cell cycle. And at different time points, you add this drug for four hours and then wash it off. So if you add them in G1 or in S phase, which part of the cell cycle are the cells more susceptible in? That's basically the idea, because a short period of addition of the drug is enough to cause re-replication. And what we found was that if you add this drug in G1 and wash it away, the cells don't go into too much re-replication. This light line is the cells that were not exposed to MLN. The dark line are the cells that were exposed to MLN. But in contrast, if you add this drug in S phase, there's extensive re-replication. So this is interesting because this tells us that this drug will primarily target cells that are in active S phase. It will cause re-replication and somehow kill the cells. We still don't, didn't know at this stage how they were killing the cells. And as is typical in biology, it turned out two pathways were important. One was apoptosis. Just short treatments or even long treatments of the drug was causing PARP cleavage, was causing cells with greater than, with less than G1 DNA content. So there's extensive apoptosis following the re-replication. But on top of that, we noticed that there's also cellular senescence. The re-replicated cells had these typical morphologies, big, large cells with big, large nuclei. They're positive for senescence-associated beta galactosidase staining. And this was happening just with the short pulses of this drug. Just four to eight hours, wash it away, and 24 hours come back, or 72 hours come back, and the cells are gone into senescence. So this reapplication is pretty damaging to the cells. There's apoptosis stimulated, there's senescence stimulated, and eventually they just give up, and that's probably how the tumors are disappearing. Interestingly, this senescence, if you measure the senescence added by MLN4924, is also decreased by CDT1 knockdown. That was reassuring because MLN will inhibit tons of cullens, cull one, two, three, four, five, you name them. So it was very, and each of these cullens probably have 50 or 100 substrates. And yet, by just selectively preventing the stabilization of CDT1, we are recovering the cells significantly. We are decreasing the senescence. So their original premise was correct, that it's the CDT1 stabilization that seems to be so toxic for these cells. And then we had one surprise. Now you all know that DNA damaging agents generally work much better on P53 plus cells and much less on P53 minus cells. This is actually a problem because 50% of human cancers are mutated in P53. And so you know, most of our best drugs don't work so well on those tumors. Well, so MLN seems to be an exception and we don't know why. Here is the a wild type HCT116, and this is a P53 minus minus HCT116. And we are basically looking at the survival of the cells with a very short pulse of MLN4924 treatment, eight hours treatment and wash out. And you can see that the P53 minus minus cells die quite nicely, right? If anything, they die a little bit better than the wild type cells, which is sort of an exception. So this too has got Millennium very excited because if they have somehow uh, uh, sort of stumbled onto a drug that is more effective in P53 minus cells, that's kind of good. And we sort of have the theoretical framework for why that is. Remember I told you that we could see much more re-replication if the cells were P53 minus. So it's possible that that's one of the reasons why these cells are, uh, the P53 minus cells are doing poorly in the presence of this drug. So what I've rushed through, I apologize for not showing too much data, uh, most of the data that I did show is like the, the recent data that is um, um, not yet published. What I've shown you till now is that re-replication is prevented in the normal cell cycle by multiple mechanisms. I've told you that the geminin CDT1 is important, as is the high CDK activity. You mess up with any of those, or probably both of them, you can get re-replication. I've told you that re-replication causes extensive DNA damage that activates checkpoint pathways. But what's really interesting is that many of the checkpoint pathway proteins are also happen to be ones that are mutated in cancer susceptibility syndromes, P53, BRCA1, Fanconi and Mia proteins. I like that because as one of the things that people often wonder about is how is DNA damage being generated in deep in our bone marrow, for example. So of course, one of the most popular ideas is 
reactive oxygen intermediates. And sure, they're probably important, but I also think that DNA replication per se is extremely uh, mutagenic. It is not as smoothly carried out as we think that I think this dynamic balance of geminin CD21 is, seems like a terrible way to control such an important process. There will be some time or the other, temporarily, where geminin will be lower than CD21 in some cells, or CD21 will be more. And I suspect that this kind of DNA damage gets generated much more than often, but of course, being metazoans, we don't care because we just get rid of those cells. But if the pathways for sensing that damage and getting rid of them is messed up, then the metazone is in trouble because those cells with extra copies of DNA, mostly poorly replicated with damaged DNA, are going to hang around. And finally, even though you'd imagine that this is a, a cancer susceptibility pathways, remarkably, MLN4924 probably pushes the balance much more towards excessive re-replication and so ends up being terribly toxic to S phase cells and kills them. And interestingly, it seems to be killing P53 minus cells as effectively, if not more effectively, than P53 plus cells. I'll take a minute's pause because I'm going to change gears at this point. But if there are any pressing questions or anything, this would be a good time to ask for this part of the talk. If there are no pressing questions, yes, Lawrence. Yeah, you just took the words out of a recent reviewer. Um, they basically, it wasn't you probably, but like they wanted us to know if we have looked at all the P53 mutants. We haven't. And in fact, I'm trying to argue back, saying that let's first look at the definition of the situation with the null situation, and then a next paper can be the mutants. But yes. <laughs> Yes. What about CDC6 with Yeah. So many years back, we had shown that CDC6 during S phase gets pushed out into the cytoplasm due to phosphorylation. And that still turns out to be true. In fact, John Diffley recently sort of elaborated on that by saying that, um, um, that not only is that happening, but the, CDC, the phosphorylation by the cyclin dependent kinase also helps stabilize the CDC6 somewhat. In C elegance, CDC6 seems to be extremely important. So Ed Kepris has data where he sees that if he prevents this shuttling out of CDC6 by phosphorylate, by preventing the CDK2, then he gets re-replication per se without even altering the geminin CD21 balance. The initial attempts at this, in fact, when you used to still talk on DNA, work on DNA replication, when you made the CDC6 that was mutated in the cyclin dependent kinase sites and we got the CDC6 constituted in the nucleus, we never got any re-replication. So again, this could be a cell line issue. We haven't ever gone back and checked with that mutant of CDC6 in multiple different cell lines. Or it could be that in mammalian cells, the geminin CDT1 balance and the cyclin dependent kinase, which are more uh, upstream in some ways, are more important. But they might contribute. In fact, one experiment that I should do and haven't done is play around with the geminin CDT1 balance in the presence of that mutant CDC6 and see if you get more replication. But we haven't done that experiment. Okay, yes? Does PCNA ubiquitination have an effect on CDT1 binding? So, not in that, uh, well, let me think about this for a second. Uh, so we did the K164, we did the experiment in the easiest way possible, which is the K164R mutation. And that was still happily interacting with the CDT1. So ubiquitination is not required for the interaction. Does ubiquitination disrupt the interaction? Hard one to test. You know why? Because it's very hard to see the ubiquitinated PCNA, PCNA in uh, sort of normal cell lysates. You know, whenever we show the ubiquitinated PCNA, we sort of boil the cells and extract them right away. So essentially, the experiment would be if your IP CDT1, under conditions where the CDT1 PCNA interaction is maintained, can you see mono ubiquitinated PCNA co IPing? And we haven't seen it, but that's probably because there's the de ubiquitinators are killing them off. Yeah, so it's an elaborate way of saying that we don't know. It's not required. Does this imply that there is DNA polymerase data there? But the question is second, does it occur on DNA or PCNA binds or in solution? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So 
we don't know the answer to that because, of course, there are three subunits of PCNA, and so at the very least, a PCNA circle can probably interact with three proteins if you believe Steve D. Bell's work on Archaea PCNA. Um, but the question, there are two parts of it. Do all proteins that interact with PCNA, do they get degraded? So why doesn't Paul Delta get degraded? Because Paul Delta uses also a pip box. And the answer is actually in the threonine 7. So I don't know how many of you noticed it, but when I'm showing you the, the, the boxes that define the pip box, the Q, XX, M, XX, FF, the threonine was not in that sequence. The threonine was actually next to the Q. It turns out that threonine is amazingly important. So all the substrates of pip box containing proteins that are sub turning out to be substrates of CRL4, CDT2 have this threonine. While other sub proteins like Paul Delta or FEN1, which interact with PCN and don't get degraded, don't have that threonine, right? So that's probably one explanation. There could be others. And the uh, question of whether it's, it, it does it only on chromatin or not is a vexed question because we have crossed swords with others who are working on this. So. Uh, Johannes Walter has Xenopus egg extracts where he can do the chromatin, add chromatin or take away, or not add chromatin. And if he, does, if he doesn't add chromatin, he doesn't get the degradation. So his opinion is that the degradation is happening only on chromatin. However, not for CDT1, but for the other substrates that I'll show you, we can see the interaction with PCNA off and with the Cul4 CDT2 complex off chromatin. So again, this is a, could be a variation that uh, you know, might not be answerable. Yes. That's an excellent question. Remember, if when it's interacting with PCN, it's also getting degraded, right? So we probably won't see it. The question is, after adding MG132, do we see it moving with the replication fork? We haven't done the experiment, but it's been done for us in Drosophila. When Terry R. Weaver first published CDT1 in Drosophila, she called it a strange name, double part, I think, DUP, yeah, double part. She actually noticed by immunofluorescence on the polytene chromosomes that CDT1 was at the fork. I didn't believe it at all, but now I'm beginning to think that probably that's correct. So if, if you can protect the CDT1, it might remain at the fork. Weird if that's true. Yeah. If it's a function, we don't know. All right? So, where are, the, who are the graduate students? Put up your hands. I just noticed, because you're supposed to be evaluating me. You're my clients. Oh. Who are the PhD students in the audience? Can I see, I see a few? Oh, no, there are no PhD students here, Mauro. Is that possible? They refuse to put up their hands. Okay, fine. Um, so the question is, this is a very, very odd phenomenon. You have this substrate protein that's interacting with PCNA and it's being degraded. So naturally, you start wondering, are there other substrates that are being used by that in that way? And I knew my favorite substrate, P21. Years back, in fact, one of my initial papers from my lab was that P21 interacts with uh, cyclin CDK using the N-terminal portion. This thing is dying. Uh, using the cyclin CDK and the C-terminal portion interacts with PCNA. And we couldn't find any function for this PCNA interaction. Other more famous scientists published some stuff, but we couldn't reproduce any of them. So we sort of, you know, we didn't have a function for this interaction with PCNA. It inhibits PCNA's function, sure, but what effect does it have in the cell? So we wanted to come back to this question and ask whether P21 interaction with PCNA, whether that's important for it to be degraded by the Cul4 CD2 complex. But wait a minute, I just told you that the Cul4 CD2 complex gets activated by DNA damage. And yet, we know that P21 is actually induced by DNA damage. But there's a second story to that, which is that after the initial induction, P21 actually does go away. It's a longer time course, around three to six hours after DNA damage. And this going away process is dependent on proteasomes. Because if you add MG132 at the six hour point, the P21 comes back to life without any change at the P21 RNA. So after the initial induction of P21, there's actually an active proteasome dependent degradation of the protein. This degradation happens on chromatin and off chromatin, and the P21 field had been sullied by a lot of stuff on skip 2 cul one complex being involved in P21 degradation, but this degradation doesn't seem to be dependent on skip 2 You remove skip 2 by siRNA of skip 2 
the P21 is still getting degraded. The basal level of P21 goes up, so CUL1 skip 2 might have some role, but the post damage degradation of P21 doesn't seem to be affected by removing skip 2. So to make a long story short, CUL4 DDB1. Here is the normal degradation of P21 following DNA damage. You remove CUL4 and the P21 is stable. Remove DDB1 and the P21 is stable. I'm not going to take you through all the data at this point. Just going to summarize for you. So degradation of P21 needs CDT2. You know, standard siRNA of CDT2, the P21 is stable after siRNA. Needs PCNA. You siRNA, PCNA, P21 is stable. And needs the PIP box of P21. If you mutate the PIP box, the P21 is stable. The poly of P21 in vivo needs all of this. The interesting point was in vitro, because you can imagine how reviewers think, right? Oh, this is secondary. You know, you're affecting protein X, and protein X is affecting P21. So of course, the correct test is to see if you can see this polyubiquitination of P21 in vitro. So you could get very weak polyubiquitination of P21 in vitro by this cul 4 cd 2 complex, and that needs PCNA and the PCNA-P21 interaction. And finally, just like CDT1, Remember how CDT1 got degraded in S phase by the CUL4 CDT2? It turns out that P21 is also degraded extensively in S phase without any exogenous DNA damage by this CUL4 uh, CDT2 PCNA complex. Here's our evidence of the in vitro polyubiquitation because I think that's really what makes the story. This is P21. You add the CUL4 CDT2 and the E2, you get this weak polyubiquitation. No one was very happy with this until we read the literature and found that there is one particular uh, serine, 114, of P21 that had been implicated in some way of being important for the degradation. It seemed to be phosphorylated by the, jun the junk pathway. So we converted the serine to a glutamic acid to mimic the phosphostate, and now we got very nice polyubiquitination of P21. In contrast, this is the polyubiquitination of P21 by the skip to cal one complex. So what we think is happening is that in this case, probably the P21 needs to be phosphorylated to promote its interaction in PCNA in a way that facilitates the polyubiquitination. Okay? So all of this again has been published. So again, my data is being summarized for you. So that was P21. So once you get a hit like that, of course, you, it gets tantalizing. You start wondering, are there other hits like that? And then we came across a completely unexpected substrate. And this came from a thought experiment. So here is the whole picture, CUL4, CDT2, uh, interacting with PCNA, interacting with the substrate, and the substrate is getting polyubiquitinated. So postdoc in the lab just took it one step further and started wondering, well, PCNA is sitting here, right? So could the PCNA get ubiquitinated? In this case, monoubiquitination of PCNA, as you know, is a big story. It's a big story for error bypass polymerases, error prone bypass polymerases. So if there's a lesion in the DNA, the, uh, the PCNA is coming along with Paul Delta with the replication fork. The Paul Delta gets replaced and Paul Eta or Zeta get attached. And then the Paul Eta or Zeta put the uh, mismatching nucleotide across from the lesion to help bypass the lesion. Now, this Paul Eta or Zeta will interact with PCNA only when it's monoubiquitinated. Now, since this is a big story, it's also been exhaustively worked on, and people have found that this E2 and E3, RAD6 and RAD18, are essentially important for PCNA monoubiquitination, and this d ubiquitinase is important for removing this monoubiquitination. So what Kenta wanted to know, essentially, was could CUL4 CDT2 DDB1 complex be another E3 ligase that's monoubiquitinating in the PCNA? So how do you prove that? Simple, sRNAs. So here's the PCNA. And as I was telling you, to see the PCNA monoubiquitination, you really have to denature the cells very actively so that dubiquitination is not uh, hanging around. If you knock down the dubiquitination, you can see a significant amount of PCNA monoubiquitination without any DNA damage. This is just undamaged cells. Lots of PCNA monoubiquitination. If you knock down RAD18, that other E2, E3 pathway, you decrease the monoubiquitination. We are thrilled to see that if you knock down CDT2, you also decrease the monoubiquitination and you knock down both of them, you decrease the monoubiquitination even more. So there are actually redundant pathways by which the PCNA is getting monoubiquitinated. 
And again, the proof is in the in vitro experiment. In the in vitro experiment, you incubate PCNA with the CUL4 CDT2, boom, it shifts up into this size, which is recognized by PCNA antibody and ubiquitin antibody. So the PCNA is getting monoubiquitin quite effectively by the CUL4 CDT2 complex in vitro. Uh, I published this, so I'm just going to show you what the story is. It turned out that this, in, you could even see this in a mutagenic assay. So the error-prone bypass pathway, by putting in this junk nucleotide across from the lesion site, essentially causes a mutation. And so you can measure the mutation rate by this assay, by which if there is mutation, you get white colonies in bacteria after you've recovered the plasmid from mammalian cells or the blue original wild type colonies. And so the more white colonies you get, there's more mutation happening in the mammalian cell. And in this assay, predictably, if you remove USP1, the deubiquitinase, the white colony number goes up dramatically because you are getting more monoubiquitination of the PCNA. But interestingly, removing RAD18 or CDT2 knocks down the white colonies, and removing both knocks it down further. So it does look like this CUL4 DDB1 complex is looking at, at like an independent E3 ligase that adds monoubiquitin to the PCNA. So this, of course, immediately raises a whole host of questions. Here is CRL4 CDT2 that's well known to be a polyubiquitination guy. It's putting multiple ubiquitins and directing a protein to proteasomes. But now we have an example where it's producing a monoubiquitin in a DNA damage context, and we don't know why. We don't know why that ubiquitin doesn't get extended to a polyubiquitin chain. So what I've shown you here is that the CRL4 CDT2 uses PCNA to promote the degradation of many substrates relevant to genomic instability, CDT1, P21. Uh, Matt Michael in C. elegans has shown that Paul Eta itself is polyubiquitinated. Bob Duronio in Flies have shown that E2F1 is getting polyubiquitinated. So I think this list will keep on growing. Amazingly, there's also a basal level of PCNA monoubiquitination, which is not dependent on exogenous DNA damage, and that seems to be significantly affected by CRL4 CDT2. I didn't show you the data for any of this, but PCNA has to retain its lysine 164 to get the monoubiquitination. And this may be a way of uh, mutation at Grill. The last few minutes, I'm sorry, Lawrence, this is terrible. Um, I'm going to touch on HPV just to sort of finish this uh, part of the story because we came across this completely accidentally, and, but I think it's very interesting. So, of course, you know, you, you know it's not worth telling about, about it, and you know about E6 and E7 and all the zillions of substrates that they have been supposed to be affecting. But I think we've got, come, got to come across a new substrate. And he came across this completely by accident. I love saying this. Genetic assays are just like that, right? You discover all these things completely by accident. So what we noticed was that when he added MG132 in HeLa cells, suddenly phospho-H2X levels in HeLa cells dropped. That was all that we noticed initially. And the postdoc who did it was a very careful guy, and he kept on following up on it. Because you know, MG132 can affect hundreds of substrates. But he had earlier shown that phospho-H2X is affected by three things that he was fond of. PP1, SOR1 complexes, and TYP60. TYP60 is a histone acetyl transferase. So he said, well, I'm going to look at each of these and see if any of these are affected by adding the MG132. And to his amazing surprise, he found that when he added MG132 to HeLa cells, TYP60 levels went up. So TYP60 was stabilized. But then he tried to reproduce it in other cells, and he couldn't see it. He could just see it in HeLa. So then we started wondering, what's strange about HeLa? And of course, HeLa has the human papillomavirus, and it's expressing E6 and E7. So then we started wondering, could it be that E6 or E7 are important in the degradation of, in the TYP60 decrease? That's how we came up to it. And that turned out to be right. So here is siRNA of E6. And you can see TYP60, which is barely detectable in HeLa, comes up dramatically, the same way as P53. So all those people who worked on E6 and P53 were right. But TYP60, interesting. And as I told you, whenever TYP60 goes up, phosphate H2X comes down. So TYP60 is supposed to, I can talk about it later, but TYP60 is important for removing the phosphate from H2X. So then we sort of went through the usual series of experiments. Here we are transfecting the flag TYP60 with the uh, HPV18 E6, and the flag TYP60 is decreased. If you add MG132, the flag TYP60 is stabilized. 
I discovered how much papillomavirus people hate HeLa. Uh, because every time I started talking about it, people kept on asking what are primary human keratinocytes. So I went to Louise Chow and got from her primary human keratinocytes and primary human keratinocytes containing HPV18 and TIP60 levels are low. You add MG132 and TIP60 levels increase. So this was beginning to look quite interesting. And in fact, the half-life of TIP60 is significantly affected by the presence of E6. So this is back in HeLa. And we are measuring the half-life. Just look at the two graphs. By adding cyclohexamide, you're looking at the rate at which the protein disappears. So in normal HeLa, the TIP60 decreases very rapidly, as shown here. But if we add an siRNA that knocks down HPV18, E6, and E7, the TIP60 is significantly stabilized. OK, again, summary. The important part that's here is that we can see both in vivo and in vitro that TIP60 is destabilized. We can find the domain of E6, that the N-terminal region of E6 is important for this interaction, but not the extreme N-terminus, but N-terminal about 43 amino acids. That's important because the P53 literature, of course, makes it clear that the extreme N-terminus of, of E6 is very important for degrading P53. Here it needs a little bit more of the N-terminus. It doesn't use E6AP. Again, everybody is probably familiar with this, that E6 interacts with P53 and E6AP and promotes the uh, degradation of P53. But that doesn't seem to be true for TIP60. And it's destabilized by both high and low risk HPV. So um, HPV18 E6 decreases P53, 11 E6 decreases P53, sorry, 16 E6, excuse me. The low risk HPVs 11 and 8 don't decrease P53. But when you're looking at TIP60, all of them decrease TIP60. So we think it's some other mechanism. We don't think it's the mechanism by E6AP. It's some other mechanism by which the TIP60 is being degraded by the, by the E6. So I'm going to skip a whole lot and just tell you how is this relevant for the DNA damage response. So we started wondering, why would TIP60 be important? So there is one interesting paper, or two rather, which say that uh, an important function of TIP60 is to acetylate P53 on lysine 120 and move P53 to pro-apoptotic genes. So P53, as you know, can hit cell cycle arresting genes like P21, in which case the cells will hang around, but they'll be arrested in the cell cycle. Or P P53 can go and hit pro-apoptotic genes, and that will cause cell death. And this is a big question in the field as to how does P53 know when to keep the cell around to allow DNA damage repair or when to destroy the cell and go into apoptosis. And apparently, TIP60 is important for this transition. That the low-risk HPV is getting rid of TIP60 but still retaining the P53. So what that might mean is that the low-risk E6 is perhaps, perhaps, keeping the P53 away from the pro-apoptotic genes and more towards the cell cycle arrest genes. So the net result would be the cell would survive and wouldn't die. Is that true? So we address that by a standard gene expression measurement. So we're looking at two genes here. The label will come up here. This is uh, uh, Puma, which is a pro-apoptotic gene, the dark bar, and the white bar is P21. And this is DNA damage, minus and plus DNA damage. Both Puma and P21 get induced in a P53 dependent manner. So the system is working. Now all that you're going to introduce to it is E6. And what you see right away is that as soon as you introduce E6, the Puma induction disappears. But the P21 induction remains intact. This is very exciting. And remember, this is the low risk E6, which doesn't affect the P53. The high risk E6, of course, affects both of them because it's getting rid of P53. But the low risk E6 seems to be affecting just the induction of the pro-apoptotic genes. So in conclusion, this is just a net summary of this. Again, this is just recently published. So what we found is that the E6 degrades the TIP60. By that process, it moves the P53 um, away from pro-apoptotic genes if P53 is around. It turns out, and we are working on this right now, that many cellular genes are also affected through this TIP60 degradation. So we're excited about that because this would be a new way by which E6 could change the cell's gene expression program. And intriguingly, at least for the HPV that we looked at in the HeLa, the TIP60 seems to be repressing the expression of that gene. And that repression is through a complicated pathway, which I can discuss uh, if somebody asks me. But we think that by degrading E6, the virus is essentially helping itself by removing this repressive signal, okay? 
future directions. This is important, right, for future graduate students. We have to identify the ubiquitin ligase that's cooperating with E6, and Lawrence might have a good candidate, which we are supposed to be testing. Generating a TYP60 mutant resistant to the E6-mediated destabilization is very important to find out how important this is for cell transformation and viral replication. And of course, this repression of the viral promoters by TYP60 is unusual. So I'm going to end here thanking all the people who have done a lot of this work. Uh, doctors, the re-replication story, Dr. Zhu, who's an assistant professor at George Washington, Dr. Machida, who's now at Mayo Clinic, Dr. Senga, who's at Nagoya University, um, the uh, P21 degradation by cycling dependent, uh, by, sorry, skull 4 CDT2 is Dr. Abbas, who is also probably going to leave the lab soon because he got a very fancy NIH award. Dr. Terai, where is he? Uh, here. He did the PCNA monoubiquitination, and he's also going on to his no own lab uh, in next spring. GA is a graduate student who's graduating. Uh, Sudhakar is the guy who discovered the TYP60 uh, degradation by E6, and he's also on the job market. So you can imagine the basic theme, which is that many, many people are leaving the lab, so I'm eagerly looking for postdoc applications to carry out all these ex exciting projects. So I'm going to end here and leave this in case anybody has any questions and a reminder of questions by looking at the summary. Thank you.